You know, years ago, I used to play soccer. I know I'm old, but uh, when you come out of South America, that's what you do from the time you can walk. You play soccer. You play, I, I always find it interesting, though, why America calls soccer soccer and football football. But that's another day. That's another day. But I used to play soccer, and I remember one day we were going up for a championship game. We were all in the locker room, and everybody's focused. Coach give his speech. And my te a teammate, a few stalls down, started saying, man, you know we ain't gonna win this game. I said, what? He said, no, we ain't not gonna win this game, man. They have a lot of foreign players. You're the only foreign player we got. He said, we're not gonna win this game, man. We, we may, you know, we could probably maybe keep, it, keep the defense strong and do one zero, but I don't even know why y'all getting all pumped up. I said, Please, do me a favor. He said, what's that? Stay in the locker room. I don't want you outside. I don't want you to be out there with me today. I said, he said, man, why are you being like that? I said, because we've been, you know, we played together. It's my senior year, so I want to win like ever. I was going to share some blood that day. That's my last game. I want to come out on top. I said, man, stay in the room. He said, why are you being mean to me, Paul? I said, I'm being mean to you because you've lost when we could win. You see, at the end of the day, at any game, Anything will go wrong. Anybody can do something. We always have a chance when we're in the game. And so I said to him, why don't you just not be in the game today? I ain't gonna tell the rest of the teammates. We're teammates, we stick together. But I don't want you in the game today. I hope the coach keep you on the bench. He says, man, you're being tough. I said, no. We've been together four years. We've been winning and losing. But we've never lost the mindset to win. See, we walk around talking about a whole bunch of stuff. We say, I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ, put on the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, sword of the spirit. We say all these things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you know why the scriptures say those things? It's because we run a winning team. The issue is, are we having a winning mindset? There's a difference. There's a difference when a person is claiming victory, but not living victory. That's a difference. It's a difference when a person believes that, you know, I can do all things through Christ, I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. He was in me, he's greater than he was in the world. Ah, you know, all these verses, we could quote them, we could say them, but when we face difficulties, we act like God surprising us. We face difficulties, we act like, oh, what is going on here, man? I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to have a blast every day. The Bible don't promise that. That's what Peter thought. Peter thought that, hey, listen, this man is coming at a time when Roman oppression is heavy. He's coming at a time when taxation is high. He's coming at a time when the Romans do all kind of evil things against us. And we've been promised this Messiah. I mean, Peter's seen him coming down the road and a donkey and a colt and, and people going, hey, Hosanna, here come the king and, and palm leaves. Peter said, this is it. Who's going to be on the right? Who's going to be on the left? We're taking this thing over. After all, he said, we're going to be on the 12 thrones of Israel and we're going to rule. We got this thing. I've left everything. This is it. I've given up all this stuff. I've made an investment. I've, I'm on this winning team. I'm ready to go. But then, boom, everything goes left. He's been saying it's going to go left. So Peter has to write to us and he says, you know what was my problem is? My problem is that I actually started to believe that this Christian life is that everything will go great, so I'm looking for happiness, not joy. He said, I'm looking for God to fix all of my problems when God is saying I'm the problem. I'm looking for God to fix all of my, solve, solve all of my issues when he's saying to me, no, your issues are already solved, you just gotta learn how to run the race. And the issue isn't what you are dealing with. The issue is how you're going about dealing it with the person who lives inside of you. My victory is not in changing your world. My victory is in changing you to live in the world to be salt and light. It's a whole different viewpoint. That's why Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12 says, don't be surprised when you experience various trials as if something strange is happening to you. It's not strange, it's the normal. You know, my brother, I have a lot of respect for him because he fought in many wars. And I learned a lot of things from my brother, an American soldier, living in Germany now. I learned a lot of things about him. One day I asked him a question, which he called, you know, brothers. Man, that was the dumbest question you intelligent Paul Cannon can ask me. That's how you would say it. 
I said, man, listen for a minute. You're out there in a tank that gets about three to five miles a gallon in the desert of Iraq. You're carrying out your mission. How you gonna get gas in the desert? He goes, that's a dumb question. I said, how's that a dumb question? What, is there an Exxon down the street? You know, what are you talking about? He says, I'm not worrying about gas. That's the tanker's job. What I'm worrying about is getting my mission done. Because I got young men here, 18, 19, 20, that are set up in my tank platoon. I gotta win the war. And if I don't win it, somebody else dies because I didn't do my job. His mindset is that he's on a winning team. And if bombs come, if, if mines go off in the ground, if bullets start flying, I'm a soldier, that's what happens. Today we live our lives as if this is heaven. When God is teaching us, I'm trying to create heaven in you, not heaven around you. I plan to burn this place up. I plan to end heaven and earth with burning it up. I'm not planning to take your earthly body to heaven. At the rapture, I'm giving you a glorified body. So why are you stressing over things? And that's why today, how do we keep a winning mindset? How do we function with a winning mindset? So when we go into ministry, we're not a problem because we are looking at problems and letting them control us, rather looking at problems and letting them mature us. Because we go to ministry and we are dealing with people and their problems. Why do you have problems? Do we talk about what we're going through? Or we trust God to get us through so we could be strength to somebody else? What is that mindset? Here's the first thing we're gonna learn. You gotta stop telling God what you think. That's what he's saying in verse six. It sounds crazy, but you gotta study the rest of the book to get it. He says, humble yourself. He didn't say God gonna humble you. He says, humble yourself. Under the mighty hand of God. Why would he bring that contrast in the text? He's bringing the contrast because what he's saying to us is, when Mike, Peter's saying, you know what? When I got this vision that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and I heard a word from God and God spoke, and I said, he is the son of God. Next thing you know, I'm telling him he's not gonna die. And he has to look at me and say, get behind me, Satan. I was once this person who heard from God who's now being influenced by Satan because I chose to take the way I think to tell him what to do because all of a sudden, I got a word from God. See, Peter says, there's a time in Luke chapter 22 where he says, I told Christ I'm not going to die. You're not going to die, Christ, you're not going to die. We're going to be with you, you're not going to die. And Christ would look at me and say, man, listen, Satan is in heaven right now trying to sift you like wheat. And I'm praying for you, Peter, because you're going to deny me three times. When you face the ultimate fight that Satan can put on me, the fight of life and death, when you face that, Peter, you're going to back up. Because you keep looking for this day where you sit on the right or on the left. You're looking for this day when you're going to be on the 12 thrones of Israel. You're looking for the party time. You're not looking for the fact that you're at war. And in this war, even though when it looks like you're losing, you're winning. But if you don't have the mindset, Peter, you're going to, you're going to walk away from me and after three years of discipleship, you're going to start cussing. Understand, please, Peter learned that if I did not bring myself under the authority, mighty hand, I didn't bring myself under the authority of God, then I cannot live with his mindset. I cannot live a life surrendered. I cannot live a life trusting. I cannot live a life growing. So as a result of that, I am end up fighting for myself when he's telling me that's the thing I need to neglect. He says, if you're gonna be my disciples, you must deny yourself, pick up a cross. My load is easier, my burden is lighter, but you gotta pick up a cross to follow me. You gotta be in a marriage relationship where the wife may start out all Christian and twist on you. You gotta be in a relationship where the person or the husband may be this man of God that now goes into ministry and turns left, and now you got a miserable husband at the house. You may have to deal with the fact that you have a baby, and now your baby comes out quadriplegic. Then what, is God mad at you? You have to, may have to go deal with the fact that your husband goes to a church, you go to a church, you're all excited coming out of school and you run into people who don't like you. What do you do then? Do you grab the Bible or your feelings? Do you grab your, the Bible or do you decide this is too stressful? Paul would say no. I faced my struggles. I looked at my struggles and I got to the point that I lived such a victorious life I could look at life and say be anxious for nothing. Amen. That's the victory. So if Peter's saying, 
that mindset led me to argue with God than to trust God. So instead of coming under God, I try to go above him and tell him what to do. And I have to start learning to come under him so I can learn how to live in his mindset because that's the winner. You see, that's the first thing I would say about a winner. It's bringing yourself under a word that is powerful and sharper than a double-edged sword and it does not come back empty. It just looks empty sometimes. You know, I, I messed with our young people one day and I said, you know, I, I didn't tell them who I was talking about. I said, just suppose you went to a, 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 an event and you saw this man and he has on not the best nice looking clothes. He, he walks around, he, he don't really, he's poor. He's poor, he's a poor guy. He don't have a lot of money, he don't have a lot of stuff. And then one day you see a bunch of people beating up on him and he stays quiet while they beat him. You just beat the socks off of them. He says, quiet. And by the time they figure out what I'm saying. And I said, then you, then you see him on the cross in his underwear. Bruised, battered. Soldiers putting a hole in his side, mocking him, grambling over his garments. Would you believe in him if you were standing in that day? Or would you have said, crucify him? You see, we have to learn to come under when especially people that, one of the struggles I have with hiring Bible students or seminary students is that they think that degree makes them everything. And what I have to teach them all the time, all that degree tells you is you're in the plane, you're on the runway, but you still gotta listen to the tower. Here's the second thing. Second thing, we find about a winning mindset. The second thing he says about a winning mindset, he says, is that there's a proper time. There's a proper time. In other words, some people get out of school and they're thinking, I wanna be this, I wanna be that, I wanna be all these things. God had to teach me, get out of school and just be what I asked you to be. Because there's a proper time. See, Peter wanted to be on the right to left, he wants to be on the 12 thrones of Israel, he wanted all these different things. But if he held on to those things and gained those things, he would have missed Pentecost. So there's a proper time. Peter's saying, if I humble myself, I come under the authority of God, I work hard to do what God wants me to do, and I give God everything I need to give him, when he's ready to promote me, that's when I'm ready to be promoted. And that's when I'm ready, at that proper time. You know, in that game, we were really playing hard. It's one of them games where you come out and your knees are bloody and your hips are bloody, and you know, the halftime reality hits you and you're looking at the clock, you're still zero, zero, and you're sitting there halftime, it's hot Texas, you know, Drink, <laughs> drinking Gatorade, you know, Gatorade tastes real good when you're thirsty. And you're drinking it, and everybody's looking at each other going, man, they like on our side of the field too much. What's going on? So you guys are losing the day. It's funny, I didn't know I was going to be a preacher, but I was a preacher that day. I look at them and I say, because you guys have lost. Offense keeps dropping back into defense. We don't have enough spacing. When we get the ball, you guys are playing defense, just trying to not lose. So you're playing defense so much that when we have the ball, we have no offense. So when I get the ball as a fullback, I'm trying to find offense, I have to create it. Then I got three guys around me, I got to back it up. Guess where we back? I'm passing it back. What does that mean? They bring their offense back. We don't stand a chance to lose because the offense is not willing to be an offense. And if we want to do well in this game, y'all got to stop thinking about not losing. You see, Peter was more concerned about that. How do we not lose? How do we continue forward? I'm going to go hide. I'm going to go back to fishing. Christ had to say, I have a proper time if you just stay in the game. Game isn't over yet. Clock hasn't gone off yet. I got a time for you. And if you don't learn to run this race with endurance, you missed your time. That's why he said this third thing. He says, cast your cares. Who is a fisherman, right? What's fish people do? They have nets. When I'm out in Africa, in the Caribbean, they use nets, okay? They take them nets, they throw it out there. He says, the thing that would rob me from ever experiencing this winning game is my anxieties, my anxieties. 
my anxieties, my worries, my stresses. Luke chapter 8 verse 14 says, it kills my spirituality. I could hear the Bible, I get excited about the Bible, but these thorns come. And these thorns start to prick me. Am I going to graduate? These thorns prick me. Am I going to leave here single? These thorns prick me. Am I going to make class? These thorns prick me. What is my spiritual gift? These thorns prick me every day. He's saying, it ain't your thorns. We are not designed to carry them. That's why the Bible says, meet your anxiety with prayer. That's why the Bible says, to cast your load upon God. He says, the thing I have to learn to do is, once and for all, when anxiety come upon me, is to remind myself I don't own it anymore. It's an aorist tense. He's not saying a present tense, keep casting. He says an aorist tense. He's saying, once and for all, I cast it. So anytime it comes back on me, I remind myself I don't have it anymore. You know, I remember pastoring during COVID, calling friends who were going, man, I quit. I said, you quit for what reason? I'm done. Come on, Paul, I'm done, done. You know, black folk, we don't say done. We say done, done. That's how we say it. He said, I'm done, done. I said, no, you're done. You're not. If you were done, done, you wouldn't be calling me. He says, well, what, what are you talking about? I said, this is, you ever open up the Bible and understand why the church scattered during COVID? That's scattered because diaspora. Study it. That's not the first time that God's people scattered been historically that way because we don't listen so what are you going to do you're a shepherd isn't a shepherd supposed to guide people through the valley in the shadow of death so why are you carrying a burden for when the person who is leading you died to remove it it's not your burden I love my grandkids for that when it's too heavy papa it's too heavy you know that's why I think God should have made grandkids before he made kids I really do. It's the best deal ever. You get to keep them, you get to spoil them, you get to give them all the candy, all the ice cream. When they're all fired up, you send them home. <laughs> it's the best deal. And then you get to tell them when to pick them up. You don't get to do it with kids. They're with you forever. Grandkids, pick them up at 10 o'clock. It's a nice deal. My grandkids come to me, my granddaughter comes to me and says, Papa, this is too heavy. Here you go, Papa, help me with this. Papa, listen, what is going on? Papa, I said, wow, have the faith of a child. I'm a child, you're my grandfather. Handle this. Papa, I'm hungry. Chick-fil-A, yay, let's do this. <laughs> I've discipled you well. <laughs> let's go. What you want? Don't worry about it. She says, Look at me, she goes, Papa, I want this, this, this. She don't have no job. <laughs> she didn't need no job. She just believed that because she's with me, she could order whatever she wants, and I, because I'm so lost my mind, gonna go, yes. <laughs> yes. So my granddaughter taught me, reminded me, Cass, you don't own this. You're just in the family. Enjoy the Papa. One of the reasons Satan gets us, because what Peter is saying to us is that he got me. He got me. I was so caught up in what's going on. He got me. And I became so anxious to what I'm seeing, rather than the faith I need to believe. That's why he says here, he says, you must resist Satan in the faith. Oh, faith gets all messed up these days. Faith gets all messed up these days. People say, I got faith in this, I got faith in that. I don't know what you're getting this faith from. Faith starts with the word of God. Faith is an objective thing. If it is not in the Bible, it ain't faith. It's not faith. And we make all kinds of excuses about faith. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, meaning all I know now is the Bible. I know the word of God. I know what the word of God is saying. I get what the word of God is saying. But James says, if I don't put my faith to work, it was a waste of time. If I don't humble myself, bring myself on the authority of God, let not my anxious moment stop me from obeying him, and I keep doing what he says, and I keep trusting him because he's the papa, and I keep doing everything he's saying for me to do, guess what happens? I'm not walking by faith and not by sight. Peter says, I didn't do that. I walk by sight, not by faith. He told me he's going to die. He made it clear he's going to die. But I got to be Peter, you know? I call Peter the hood disciple. He was packing. I, I got Peter, I'm going to do this. I don't need you, Jesus. I'll cut his ear off. I'm going to get this thing taken care of. You just stay behind me. I got this. 
I was controlled by the moment. I was controlled by all that was going on. I wasn't controlled by his words. That's why he says cast first before he says resist in the faith. If I don't cast, the faith is gone. If I stop being worried about this and not taking it to the scriptures, it's gone. I have to hold to the word of God and not ask it to make sense. Because if I ask it to make sense, then I'm no longer humbling myself. I just need to just do it. That's what faith is. Standing in front of Goliath. I'm going to take this guy on. 16 years of age. A seasoned warrior. Been killing people since he was a youth. And I'm going to kill him. You're crazy, David. No, I'm not crazy. It's so done. What I get for killing him? What do you mean you get for killing him? Hey, he's a Philistine. Uncircumcised. And he just cursed God's army. It's over. What do I get for killing him? It wasn't the, how big Goliath was. It wasn't how strong Goliath was. Well, all it had to do with is he's a Philistine, no covenant. He's uncircumcised. He is unable to go to the temple and get his sins forgiven. Then he did the worst thing. If you curse God's people, you're cursed. It's over. How do I win? See, David did not see Goliath. He saw the faith and trusted it. Daniel, they're going to put you in a lion's den. Bump the lion's den. I'm not going to turn around and walk away from God. So forget the lion's den. I got to do what God says. Daniel, lion's den, don't care. <laughs> Daniel, we talk about him. And we talk about all these Bible people. What we stop talking about is their journey. We just talk about their victory, not the journey. So we don't end up joining the winning team. We just become a part of the crowd. And that's why he said this full thing real quick. I know we're about out of time. But you should have known that when you just bring me up here. <laughs> he says, resist and firm in the faith, knowing that you're experienced. Listen, 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 young people. You are not alone. I've passed it over 30 years. I've passed it 30 years. I've seen it all. I've stood next to grave sites. Baby born dead. Healthy for nine months, dead. I have seen... Couples pray and beg God for a child. Elders come together and pray. Child is born. I've seen a quadriplegic. I've seen divorce, unfortunately. People that are said they're Christians. I've seen it all. But one thing God has taught me is Satan has no new tricks. He got nothing new. See, when I was on that field, the people said, Pastor Cannings. I mean, they said, Pastor Cannings. They said, Paul. <laughs> Paul, why are you not warming up? The coach told me I got to watch that guy. I'm watching him now. I'm going to watch all his moves. We didn't have film in them days, 70s. Who had film? I'm going to watch him. You're not going to warm up? Hey, man, I've been practicing four years. I just stretch. I'm ready. I'm watching him. What are you trying to watch him for? Watching his ball movement. Watching how he backs up. Watching how he collects the ball. I want to watch how he plays. Because that's the person we got to stop today. That's it. That's all I'm doing right now. So he said, that's all you're going to do, man? Because you got to warm up. Nope, I'm going to get warm. I got 90 minutes of soccer, man. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get warm in the hot sun. Come on, chill out. We're going to get this thing done. <laughs> Understand, Satan has no new tricks. He's a created being. So that's why the Bible could be written 2,000 years ago telling you everything. So that's why he says, just run the race that's set. He has nothing new, and you are never alone. What you're going through, somebody else is. No new tricks. Here's the last thing. You always remember, he always wants you to make you feel you're alone. Always. It's a trick of the devil. Peter, I'm alone in a house, dark room. Jesus died. Gotcha. You're not alone. Many times as a pastor, Satan tried to drive you into lonely moments. And he says this, folks. Last thing I say. God does not want to let life define you. He wants life to refine you. I'm going to say it one more time. God's not trying to get life to define you. If, if getting married and not getting married defines you, then you don't understand singlehood and the beauty of it. If, if you are deciding your value based on your education, then you don't understand that every child is a gift from God. 
See, understand, God does not want life to define you. He wants life to refine you. He wants life to take you to these four things. Here's the four things. He says, Peter said, I had to get here, but I had to go through the storm, the valleys, the shadow of death, to the point where, like David, I got a shepherd. I shall not want. I've so come to this shepherd. I don't want nothing. I don't lack anything. So you see, he comes and he goes. He says, he, he perfects me. He confirms me. He strengthens me. He establishes me. Oh, I wish I had time to break that down in terms of the Greek and emotions involved in that. Peter's saying, when the time come and I stood at the, and I wasn't at the cross, I was not perfected. When I stood at Pentecost, he took 40 more days to perfect me. And when he perfect me, and at Pentecost, they start beating on me, and I refused to turn against him. I was confirmed. You see, what I learned is he, he, I didn't have to have the strength. I just have to so depend on the strength inside of me, I could take on anything. So not, not only do he help to confirm me, he gave me the ability. So no matter what I can do, the ability came from the inside out. And as a result of this learning this ability inside of me, I was able to be confirmed and therefore established. Nobody could move me anymore. Because life, how God defines it, is not there to define you. It's there to refine you. So he lets Satan do whatever Satan's gonna do. He already, Paul says, I know all your schemes, Satan. What you got? You know, in the midst of the game, oh, he's right-legged, right leg. He's gonna go from left to right to take a shot. So I don't care what he's doing with his left leg. He has to come to his right. He doesn't use his left leg to take long shots. So every time he goes to move, right there. Don't watch his legs, watch the ball. In that game, we lost. <laughs> we lost the game, one to nothing, on a penalty kick. It was sick. Yeah, some soccer players are up here somewhere. It makes you sick. You're standing there sick. Wasn't even a shootout, it was sick. I went in the locker room that day, and I met a friend of mine looked at me and he goes, we didn't lose, because you taught us to win. You see, understand, Paul had the worst ministry life ever. He told him that in Acts chapter nine. Your ministry will be bad. Whipped, 39 lashes, five times. How is Jesus working for you? You get chipwrecked, and you the person bitten by a snake. Following Jesus? Don't look like it to me. How can you be in jail that many times? And God is working for you. But Paul says, what that taught me is that when I was in jail, I could write Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, because now I got time. What that taught me in going from Judaism, the Pharisee, to Christianity, I could write Galatians. I did not let my life be defined by my struggles. I let my life so refine me. I could say be anxious for nothing. I could say to you, I can do all things through Christ. I could say to you when I'm broke, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. I could tell you the struggles of this present time. Don't compare to the third heavens I saw. So I've learned that no matter what I face in this life, the trials of life shows that God loves me because he only disciplined those whom he loves. So I'm blessed, and that's why James would say, count your trials joy. Because when they're done, the one who loves you matures you, perfects you, grows you, strengthens you. So no matter what life brings you, the joy of the Lord becomes your strength. Let us stand. I know I'm, I'm past time, and I worked hard not to be, so don't beat me up over it. I still love Jesus. <laughs> but I want you to, today, I, I was like you. I wasn't in a, a Bible college, but I was like you. I gave my life to Christ at 12. Great Christian family. And at 12, I decided that the only person I will ever love is Christ, because of my mom. My mom taught me 
She was my best disciple ever. I had a great dad, homemaker mom, taught me not just to love the Bible, but to use it to fall in love with God. And to me, as a seminary student, I saw a lot of falling in love with the Bible and with ministry, but not with God. I've been married 43 years. Me and my wife probably got every reason not to be together with some of the struggles we've been through and sometimes the arguments we've had. But you know what made us stay together more than anything else? Our love for God and we can't see ourselves without each other. So we'll raise our kids, we'll argue over that. But our love keeps us together. Folks, Satan is busy. He wants to destroy you. He could tear down a tree. God could get a bird to plant another one. But you, he could have in hell. Because you practice Christianity, you really, really weren't living it. Because you never loved the person who authored it. You just love what he does. And you enjoy it. So today, just for a minute, promise, I want you to bow your heads and ask yourself, is life defining me or refining me? If your answer is yes, he's teaching you to fall in love. If your life is defining you, you're not in love yet. You're just in like. So if God does good, you like him. If he does bad, you can't stand him. He's not asking you to like him. He's hard to like. He's asking you to love him. So pray, and I'll close us in prayer. Just tell him. I don't need to know. Dear God, these kids have this, okay, young adults <laughs> have decided to come to a Christian school. Some of them are here because their parents made them. Some of them are here because, and doing what they're supposed to do because it's the culture. So today, God, I ask you to change them to get in your race. And when the game is hard, to let that teach them how you run. So, Lord, their life becomes about winning from the inside out. So that their life becomes a testimony of who you are to them, not who they are to you. So they could be like Paul. I no longer live. It is Christ that lives in me. Bless them, God, to experience the journey so that they come in love, fall in love with the giver of that journey, your son. Lord, I pray this. In Jesus' name, anybody that doesn't do that, Lord, I ask you to keep gripping their hearts until they surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for having me. <laughs>